Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Cocktail Hour. It's actually episode 64, and I'm Andy. I'm Rev. And today, I tell you, this author really doesn't need an introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. (laughs) She's a former teacher, a former market research consultant. She's got a doctor in journalism. She's a Xena fan, a Lambda winner, a Goldie winner, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Royal Academy of Bards, Alice B. Reader's Appreciation Medal, and several Reader's Choice Awards. And she's also on the board of trustees for the Lambda Literary Foundation. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to K.G. McGregor. Hi. That Thank you for having me. I've been, I've been so jealous and actually wondering why it's taken you guys so long to get around to inviting me to do this. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I begged you at the last GCLS to come on the show, and I was all tongue-tied and had to drag my friend Adrian over, and, and uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've wanted you to come on for a while. We just get, um, we get a little overwhelmed with life, and Sometimes it takes us a bit longer than we would like to get the yeah, actual invitations we out. Mm-hmm. We all do. That's true. That's true. So uh, we I ha- probably put you off so I could go do a background check. <laughs> yeah, you probably did. <laughs> um, well, before we really kick off, we've got, uh, we've got some winners to announce. We do. We have um, the winner for uh, Jove Bell's Conversation at the Bar giveaway, and that's Lisa W. And she's already been notified and happy and posting on Facebook and, and thanking everybody. So that was a great time. Uh, that was great. Well, and congratulations. Then, that's fantastic. Yes. And then um, we have Susan Maher uh, from episode 63 is giving away five books of the winner's choice. And we had, I only know two of the people, so that was a lot of fun. We have Wendy, Denise, Cheyenne, whose birthday is coming up. Um, so happy birthday, Cheyenne. Oh, wow. And Elena, of course. Oh, yeah. And Lisa T. Oh, sweet. So, yes, and, and Elena's giving me, she's knitting me some some shark sock slippers. Oh, no, she's um, not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I'm awesome. sure that it has nothing to do with the contest. It was on her list from, from previously. I, it, honestly, I swear it was just, um, you know, random.org. I didn't have anything to do with it. So congratulations to all of the winners. Yeah, really happy that, uh, that you won. Absolutely. Congratulations and happy birthday. Yay. Yay. Wow. And since we're keeping up the festivities, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com slash cocktail hour. Over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So please go over there and sign up if you haven't already. That's right. And we couldn't, we couldn't come up with a, with a book. KG had a, had a great suggestion of being Emily. And then I looked it up and there's another being Emily, but it's not the same one. So don't get that one. Yeah, don't get that one. Right. Right. You might not like that one. And then you'll think that, why would KG recommend a book like this? <laughs> yeah, we don't want that to happen. Yep. So, um, so we, we, we looked around and, and I decided I was going to recommend The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald because it's, you know, they're just making this new movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and, and the audio book is narrated by Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, and Andy then informed me that she didn't like the book and she probably wouldn't like it again. And, but, you know, you might like it, so you could use that for your free download. Mm-hmm. Or there's a load of Radcliffe books out too. You yep. can do that. Yeah. I mean, so, there you go. Yeah, and just even look at some of the recommended titles. I mean, mm-hmm. I found some very interesting historical uh, period pieces, and they've not let me down yet. So give it a shot. Just go randomly looking around. Yep. You got nothing to lose. That's right. Exactly. All right. Then. Yep. Whew, I tell you, I'm a fangirl. I'm a little nervous. I think Rev's a fangirl. She's a little nervous. We're having KG on. And, uh, I uh, <laughs> and I wanted to have a little cocktail, but I saw a cruddy movie with my brother today, and I gorged out on, you know, popcorn and snow caps. And so I'm not feeling up to par for drinking, but I think Rev's going to, Rev's going to, you know, pull the weight here. I am. I <laughs> I'm I'm going to take one for the team. I'm yeah. the only one drinking tonight, um, so I'm going to have two or three just to make sure that everybody's covered. Fantastic. Um, and then I'm having a daiquiri again. Yay! Yeah, this is a different one. Now, last time we had what 
But the, did we, we have like a pineapple, pineapple daiquiri? daiquiri yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this one is um, is just a, 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 it's got lime juice, rum, and um, simple syrup, and it was super easy to make, and it's yummy. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll, so I'll there you trying. go. Yeah, I'll try it, but not today. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll put the recipe up. Um, but it, you know, it's very refreshing. I'm not much of a rum drinker, but um, the lime is really good. It's very nice. Yeah, it sounds like it would be. Yes. It's a nice drink in uh, in Florida, which um, which is where my book playing with fuego is set but but the um my history of florida and daiquiris is that when i was teaching school i taught elementary school i taught a kindergarten imagine that mm. how scary is that <laughs> um and during the summertime there was nothing there's nothing that teachers want more than to get as far away from children as possible <laughs> and I worked as a bartender in the summertime at a marina in Fort Myers, Florida, and um, learned to make a learned to make a daunting daiquiri. Mm. I made good daiquiris, uh, and I hated to make frozen drinks because there was always actually frozen drinks weren't weren't so bad like frozen daiquiris. It was the pina coladas because they were so icky and gooey and you had to clean it up and then mm-hmm. you had to change your bar water right after that it was just i just hated those prissy people that came in and ordered the <laughs> frozen pina coladas i love pina coladas yeah they are good but I, you know I, yeah. I don't go out and order them i'll make my own yeah. make your own mm-hmm. make your own bring it to the bar you won't get any hassle from me <laughs> <laughs> well i didn't yeah i did the uh, the the shaker uh so i didn't use the I didn't have it. Uh, I didn't need the blender for this. So oh, it wasn't having... frozen. I see. No, no, and, and I really, I think I like it more um, with it not being frozen. Yeah. Well, it's just as much of a mess to clean up. <laughs> just, see. just letting you know. And, okay. And I'll and I'll say the same thing about Kahlua and cream. Same thing. Yeah. Anytime you put cream like in that. a drink, it's a mess. It is a mess. Yeah. Sticky mess. I don't know if you know this, KG, but I live in South Florida. So, oh, yeah? Where? Yeah, I live in West Palm Beach. Oh. Yep, which is about an hour, well, when I drive, it's about an hour and 20 minutes north of Miami. But Right. Um, yeah, I've been to Miami many times, and it was just so much fun to read Playing with Fuego for that reason. Yeah, it was, it was actually, I wrote that book after I, after I moved away from Miami and, um, and I'd lived there about 17 years. Wow. So, um, so I knew the place pretty well. And in fact, my, uh, my Anglo character, Daphne, uh, she and I had, had some similar experiences. (laughs) So, um, I, I had, you know, I had a lot of trouble adapting to Miami and, and it, uh, it you know rubbed me the wrong way when I first moved there because I, I was um, you know I I shared her attitudes about geez I've landed in a foreign country and <laughs> people around here don't you know they don't speak English and 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 <laughs> over time I just fell in love with the place mm-hmm. and I just fell in love with the people and and when I started doing um, when I started doing research there I was doing a lot of work for the Miami Herald and. Um, and we were doing a lot of studies in the community, a lot of focus groups and a lot of surveys. And I just had the chance to to get to know um, you know lots of people in the Haitian community and the Cuban community and the Venezuelan and Colombian communities. And it's just such a vibrant place. Mm-hmm. and and i and I tell you, the the newspaper industry, as as everyone knows, the newspaper industry is a dying industry. People mm. aren't reading the newspaper like they used to. But if you lived in Miami, you would read the newspaper every day because you just wouldn't believe the shit that goes on in that town. <laughs> yeah, you're not kidding. <laughs> that is true. Huh. So even to this day, you know, I've, I've been gone now two years, and, and it's the first site I check in the morning. It's the first... Uh, my first online stop is what happened in Miami today. Hmm. Wow. Do you get the e-paper? Yes. Yes, the, um, the Miami Herald app. Sweet. I may have to check that out just for the entertainment value. <laughs> oh, it's, you, you, will, you will think at times you're reading The Onion 
because you think, no, this can't possibly be true, but it is. That's fantastic. I mean, you you read about stories of, of you know a suitcase being found in the middle of I ninety five, and they opened it up, and it was there was a body crammed in there. Oh my uh, God! <laughs> and and tourists will. Uh, will go down to the front desk on Miami Beach and complain about the odor in their room, and there will be a dead body under their bed. <laughs> wow. Yeah. One of my friends who, um, who worked at the Miami Herald, uh, their, their building was right there, on the, right there on the bay, right where the cruise ships turn around. And his first day at work, he looked down, and, and there was a floater in the bay, you know, a, a body just upside down in the bay and and he got all exercised about it and was running around screaming that you know somebody send a reporter out there and you know call the police and and uh another person looked up and peered over the edge of his desk and looked down into the bay and said we don't cover floaters (laughs) not interesting enough not interesting enough wow (laughs) wow tough crowd yeah right Mm. jeez well, um, do you, let, let's get started talking about uh, playing with fuego, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Um, I I, uh, I really like this. I well, well, I'm going to do the summary. Sorry, I get a little tongue tied initially, so I'll loosen up after I have more to drink. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take a, a bit. I wrote a review for this the other day. Uh, it's out on uh, the C Spot Review site, so I'm just going to take a, a little bit. Two paragraphs from that uh, to, to, for, for the summary. Um, so, uh, so Daphne Maddox works for a nonprofit that rehabs houses in blighted communities. She's pretty much, she pretty much hates Miami and resents the Latin American culture that seems to be behind all that she sees as wrong with the city. Uh, she's been dumped by her girlfriend, who, whom she followed to Miami, so there's loads of bitterness there, too. Uh, she's not a bad person, but she's got some issues. Uh, Maribel Torado Leon ends up being sentenced to community service and assigned to work on one of Daphne's crews for 32 hours. Mari is rich and girly and Cuban. Uh, she rubs Daphne wrong right from the first minute they meet. As they work side by side, though, Daphne has to grudgingly admit that she respects Mari's work ethic and that she may not be as bad as she initially suspected. Um, so up to this point, pretty standard stuff. Uh, but then, KG, you just kind of took it off into a, a direction that I didn't see coming right. at all. No kidding. Um, right before, I had read uh, Community Service, uh, which is a short that kind of is like a rough outline for at least part of uh, playing with Fuego. Um, so I read that like a half an hour before I started uh, playing with Fuego because I wanted to I wanted to be refreshed on on the details in that story. So when when um, you know once you started twisting things a bit, I just I was not expecting any of that. Um, and you also the way that you have um, you know Daphne's character really um, you know at the beginning she's just really unhappy mm-hmm. and and. Um, <laughs> And doesn't doesn't have a problem with with you know sharing with us um, exactly how she feels about things, but it was really it was very nice to to watch her change as she as she got more comfortable with the community uh, with the with the various communities and um, and it was interesting for for me as a reader to learn about the different. Uh, the different immigrant communities in Miami. I have I've never been to I've never been to Florida. I have no idea. Um, so that was really interesting too. Well, if you um, if you want to understand Miami, you you probably have to understand the Cuban community first. It's um, the the city is. The, the city of Miami is two-thirds Hispanic, and two-thirds of the Hispanics are Cuban. Mm-hmm. So the Cuban community typically dominates the, um, the political class because, um, because the rest of the, the communities are, um, are a minority compared to—the uh, the, the Cuban community, rather, has a plurality in the— um, 
in the community a plurality voice. And so um, at the very front of what defines the old Cuban community is a um, an unadulterated hatred of Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. it, it Everything about him um, just turns the stomach, turns the collective stomach of the Cuban community, and they um, and they await his his death so that they can throw a big party in the street. Um, and the first person who announces it will probably have a building named after them. <laughs> um, and in fact, last year the. Um, Last year, the, the Marlins, the poor, sucky Marlins, <laughs> um, their, Ozzie Guillen became their new manager, their, the baseball team, and uh, he was asked in an interview who he admired, and he said he admired Fidel Castro because mm. he was so tough. And, and there was such an immediate outcry that people started tearing up their season tickets, and he was hated after that. He, he could not have done anything right for the rest of the year. Had the, even if they had won the World Series, he would I never remember. have been forgiven for that. Yeah, because, I remember seeing that in the news. And, and so that was one of the reasons that the story took the turn that it took. I really wanted to, I really wanted to underscore the importance of that. In, um, and to understand the community, you have to understand that uh, their memory is that they were, they literally had their homes taken from them. They were, um, they were exiled. Um, I mean, they, they chose to exile themselves. They left in mass, um, to get away from the communist regime and they forfeited everything they and their families had worked for mm -hmm. to the state, to, uh, to a dictatorship. And, um, and a dictatorship that, that ruined, that absolutely ruined the, um, the hopes for a, um, a prosperous Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, so, and so Cuba, in fact, the, the spirit of the old Cuba now lives in Miami. Mm -hmm. and, and they have, you know, they, they came to the city not speaking English, but they came with, with a determination to rebuild their lives and they and they did and they rebuilt the city and and uh, um and and to have a real appreciation for that you know i i just needed to put that in the book yeah. i needed to i needed to show how important that was and then the twisting the twisting the uh the, the intrigue a little bit was uh, was just some fun i had yeah, yeah i didn't lie. expect that <laughs> The um, one of the I think one of the effective ways that, that you're able to show uh, 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 some of the, the 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 background with the community uh, the Cuban community is the contrast between Daphne and her upbringing her family with um, with Mari's family. Um, I thought that that was very effective, and um, it, I don't always do real well with first person books and and. I think I think in order to, I don't see how you would have been able to really show uh, Daphne's metamorphosis without it being that way. Well, and I couldn't have and I couldn't have hidden the intrigue. That That's later. true, right? Um, because you would have known all along that um, that Mari wasn't involved, and that was and it was a critical question for for. Daphne to play over in her head was Mari part of this or not? Did Mari know about this or not? This was actually my first uh, my first book I've done in first person, and um, and I enjoyed it. But this was a different book. This was not um, this is not standard fare for me. But it was it was a nice break from some of the stuff that I've worked on lately. I really enjoyed it. I I, <clears throat> I had read Community Service a few years ago and. I, I kind of, you know, I, I remembered a little bit of it, so, but it was so, I was, it's been so long since I read it, I went fresh into playing with Fuego, but I listened to it with a text-to-speech program. So I didn't actually read it, read it, I listened to it, and I, I, the, the build-up, 
you know, uh, how you how you wrote Daphne uh, and how, you know, she's getting along and, and, you know, her unhappiness with Miami. And then I love her her neighbors that <laughs> she does things with. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Believe me, they're a composite of a number of people I know in Miami. They're just <laughs> exactly like that and just totally adorable. Oh, my goodness. I really, really like them. That was awesome. And and then bringing Mari in and her initial misconceptions about Mari and then as she gets to know her and, and gets to, you know, know the Cuban community um, better. And, and and then you flipped it on its head with, the, with that, that intrigue and I was like, oh, I could because I was reading it on my drive to work and at lunchtime and on my drive home. So there was times that, you know, I would take like a 10-minute little break from work and run outside and listen to it some more because I'm like, I can't stand it. Where's it going? Where's it going? So it was it was fantastic. I really enjoyed well, I'm it. Really, I'm really glad you I'm really glad you enjoyed it. One of the problems that that every writer has in in stories like that is that when you open a book, there's, there's, you have to be so careful not to go too far in creating a character who really needs to grow. Mm. And, and um, Daphne really, really needed to grow up. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, was, she was not really very likable. And, and, and I was you know, trying to trying to put her in a place where people could people could then watch her get to know instead of being on the outside and looking over at the multicultural community she stepped into it mm-hmm. and began to uh, experience it from the inside and began to realize just how wrong she was in her stereotypes and her and but 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 I'll confess that you know I've got some notes from readers who didn't even get that far. They just didn't like her enough to keep reading. Wow. And and that's a um, you know that's always a hazard when you when you um, start with a character and and uh, send them down a um, a not so nice journey. Yeah. But um, but <laughs> thanks for reading. <laughs> thanks for reading the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I hope you were satisfied that, that she grew enough. I think she probably still has some growing to do. but um, It was very satisfying. Yeah. Well, good. It felt, it good. felt authentic. Yeah. yeah her, her growth felt very authentic. Yep, yep. Absolutely. I, well, I do I have was, to say... The, oh, yeah. the, one of one of my favorite scenes was when the cat jumped off the off the, the balcony. <laughs> oh yeah, I, <laughs> that was awesome. I was like, <gasps> <laughs> well, yeah. what was funny about that is that I wrote that scene um, about the week before that one cat made the news for falling 11 stories and living. And and it was like one of the big stories of 2012 was this cat that had fallen out of a high rise. And, and um, he was one of those top trending stories and on Google and Yahoo and... and uh, <laughs> And I'd already done it. <laughs> That's crazy. And your cat fell farther. So my cat fell farther. Mm-hmm. He fell fifteen floors. Mm-hmm. That's right. And what was he it? He landed a tre- in a palm tree. Yeah, a tree broke the fall. <laughs> it was awesome. I love awesome. how. What was the? What was the? Um, her neighbors, the older guy, was his name Mort. What was his name? Morty. Mordecai. Mordecai. Morty. Yes. I love how he was not worried about the cat falling off the balcony because the cat was too lazy. <laughs> Right. And then whack. <laughs> that was fantastic. I, I wanted to ask you, um, what made you decide, they, you, so you've got community service. It's, it's been out for years and years. How did you, how did you decide to take the, the premise, the basic premise from that and, and create something completely different? Well, the, the, Sometimes when I when I write little scribbling short stories, they they stay with me. And and many of my short stories that I wrote and posted online did stick around. Like the Mulligan series just really took off after mm-hmm. after the first story that I posted. And and um, and then the 
I photographs of Claudia. You yeah, I, I posted the story of expectations and then the sequel to that, Remembrances. And, mm -hmm. and, and there was just so much story in between that I thought about over and over and it just compelled me to write. But, but often, and, and also um, the, story, the short story Surreal, which became Out of Love. But one of the things that happens when they sit with me for a while is sometimes they not only, not only do they grow, but they change in tone. For example, the, the, the book Photographs of Claudia is really a very somber book. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the stories, uh, the short stories, don't match that at all. They're, no. they're uh, kind of light and kind of, kind of funny. Um, but the book just didn't play out that way. The, mm -hmm. um, I think the, the tone pretty much stayed the same with, with community service, but Community service was a story that I, you know, conceived on Tuesday and and posted on Wednesday. So, oh, wow. you know, I hadn't put a lot, I hadn't really put a lot into the, um, you know, the development of the characters, their backstories, their, their. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't really spent any time choosing their names. So, you know, a lot of those sorts of details got. Um, got changed. And then when you start to, when you start to plan a book and you start to think about the theme of the book, then you want to start creating a setting that reinforces that theme. And so instead of like in community service, I think I described her, um, her, the, the foreman at the, at the work site, I described him as a white guy. Well, in Miami that might happen, but it's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, your your chances of of running into um, native English speaking Caucasian people in Miami are only like you know one in one in four. <laughs> so so when you um, so when you write a story, you need to reflect all of that. And so I I was able to to uh, kind of rewrite the characters and and even uh, adapt some scenes of. Uh, from stories that I experienced myself, but that you know the ori the original community service story wasn't at all about um, culture. It wasn't all about it wasn't at all about um, getting along in a new place. That was just sort of a love story about a, you know an idea of how two women could meet. Mm. Um, and it was and it was actually um, born out of uh, one of the winters that I spent in Miami. I. Uh, signed up with with habitat and i worked with them uh two days a week uh tuesdays and thursdays because i it it let me go most of the volunteers came on saturday so i went on tuesday and thursday because i was the only person on the site other than the staff and i got to do a lot of stuff and it i, I just had great fun and and it was uh it was kind of my my project that year was to volunteer with habitat and and um, over the course of the winter, there were there were several days where we had community service workers um, on the site, and they were they were glum. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were not particularly happy about being there, but they but they uh, you know put their time in. Hmm. Wow. Um, could we? Uh, if you guys want to, I don't know. Do you want to say anything else about playing with Fuego? No, I'm good. I just, I, I just love that story. I mean, just well, let, the retelling I wanna, of it. I want to ask you. I want to ask either of you if you, um, if you recognized anyone from my former book. Hmm. Uh, no. God, now I'm thinking. <laughs> can, can I have? Can I have? A, can I have a hint? Well, yes. Um, your hint is Elena Diaz. Oh. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on. Uh, oh, my God. I've read 10 of your books within the last month, within, like, the last three weeks. Hold on. Elena Diaz. Hold on. I've got to look here. Elena Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, this is... No, I can't. No. My brain is not functioning. Damn it. She was, she was Spencer Rollins' ex-girlfriend, the IRS agent from Malicious Pursuit. Oh, that's why I... Because that wasn't one of the books that I reread. <laughs> well, there you go. 
But now I can see, I can, I remember the, and I only read the uh, the online version of Malicious Pursuit. I, I haven't gotten to that. I'm slowly but surely, I've only got, actually I think that's the only one that I have left to buy of, um, of the ones that I've read online. Well, if you bought, if you were to buy Malicious Pursuit, you would, you would find an extra chapter in there that is not online. But other than that, the story's basically the same. That, and, that's uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk with you about is, is that that's one of the big things that I wanted to talk with you about is the, um, first of all, that you leave your stories online. Um, but you, at least from what I've been able to tell, just about every story that you've published from an online uh, online beginning is different in some way. Usually, I'm finding like the endings are different. Um, yeah, it's, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about spending time thinking about things, and um, and when when you spend when you spend time with it, you think, well, you know, another ending might have worked better. And I also had the benefit of um, after posting online, I had the benefit of reader feedback. Mm-hmm. You know that didn't that didn't quite work for me, or I really wished I'd seen um, a little more of of uh, what happened between this chapter and that chapter. You know, I really would have liked to seen that fleshed out. So, um, so I learned a lot by by posting online, but the um, but for the most part the. Uh, I think it's only really the house on sandstone that's probably the most similar. I think there were really very few changes that I made um, from the online version to the uh, published version. I, I've read that book and the online one um, like three or four times. I think the I think I think the way that you handled the very end with. Um, with the way that it was announced and the way that, that you know, the, the time that she would spend uh, overseas and things like that, that was a little different. Yeah. That, that, was, the, that, was, that, was, that was quite a bit different, and I, and I think it worked better, absolutely. Well, one of the things that, that reader feedback, uh, one of the things that readers wanted to see that they didn't get to see was they wanted, they wanted to see Carly confront her boss. Mm-hmm. They, wanted, they wanted to have that... Um, they wanted they wanted her to deliver that knockout punch in person, and so it wasn't enough that that she just quit her job. They had her to you know they, they wanted her to to go and sort of rub his nose in it, and and um, and so I had the chance to do that in the book, but um, but the other you know I guess the biggest uh, influence in the changes that you see is that the stuff that went online just came out of my head, and it wasn't edited. And so, yes, there were going to be holes in those, you know, and there were going to be places where it wasn't satisfying because my editor is, uh, my editor is the advocate for the reader. My editor sits there and says, you, know, you might be telling a great story, but this is what I really want to know. Mm. And so, um, so all of those online stories that have developed have had the, the uh, added, the added hand of either Cindy Creesap or um, Catherine Forrest. Oh, wow. And Catherine Forrest, by the way, I will tell you that um, I am here in Palm Springs. I am actually sitting at her desk, <laughs> and, um, and she is outside on the patio receiving friends for her 74th birthday party. Wow. Wow. Oh. Wow. So it's a big day, and she's letting me hide. She's letting me hide in her office so that uh, um, I I asked her if she could change her birthday, and uh, <laughs> and uh, she couldn't do that. So um, well, so we worked it. We worked it out so we could do both. Well, give her our best for her birthday. That's fantastic. That is, and, and, and we'll try not to keep you too much longer. Oh, that's all right. Um, That's all right. They're they're working. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Then. They're we'll working. Keep you. They're, they're setting things up and cooking. And stuff. They're, just talk away. Excellent. Excellent. Call me back when we're done eating. <laughs> Do you miss cleanup too? That's right. Um, Andy, can we go ahead and play um, Pat's call? Sure. That, I think I'd, that that would be good for some more discussion. Absolutely. Here we go. 
Hi, this is Pat from Philly, and KG, I just wanted to tell you that my partner and I really love your stories. And one of the things that really makes that possible, I think, is that your characters are so everyday down to life in most cases. And um, I was interested in finding out which was the first story you wrote for the Academy of Arts, and um, was it turned into a full-length novel? Thank you, and keep on writing. Oh, well, thank you, Pat. Thank you for that. Um, I do try to write um, characters you might know or that you want to have as friends. And, uh, and to, hear that, that I've, to hear that I've done that is, is certainly very gratifying. Every now and then I get, a, I get a review that says, these books just kill me. These people are too real. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want my I don't want my lesbians real. <laughs> really, um, that's one of oh, the yeah. things that I love the most about hey, your books. Absolutely, well, yeah. Thank you, thank you. But you know, you you're not ever going to write. Nobody's ever going to write anything that uh, that pleases everyone. So, yeah. well, so you know you, what I say to them? Fuck them. <laughs> that's what I say because that to me, I would much rather read about about people that could live next door to me or who could be me mm-hmm. um, than, than, you know, a rich doctor married to a rich lawyer, yeah. you know, jumping out of airplanes or, you know, once in a while that's great. Um, but, but, but when it comes to, when it comes to my romance books, I want to, I want to connect. Yeah, you can I relate better. I want to connect better. with that character yeah. and I want to feel what they're feeling. Mm-hmm. And, and if somebody is, uh, you know, a Mary Jane, I can't do that. Or a Mary Sue, that's Mary what it Sue, is. Sorry, yeah. Megan's trying to teach me that term and I keep, I keep messing it up every time. <laughs> um, but uh, seriously, KG, that, that, that's what draws me to your work. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and, but, but again, let, let me let me just underscore that I do respect that everyone has um, different tastes, and um, and I am I mean a lot of people a lot of people really like to read uh, lots of erotic sex in their stories, and and um, and I respect that they like that. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to deliver that at the frequency they want, but. There are plenty of uh, writers out there who will, and so um, I, I don't. I don't disparage their taste for that at all. I don't disparage the types of characters they want to read. If they want to read uh, Uber Zena stories over and over again, that's um, you know that's that's fine. Whatever they want. But but when I write a story, um, I just have to get to know the characters and and let them be who they are and. And it doesn't mean I won't write a CEO, but if I'm going to write a CEO of some big corporation, believe me, that person's going to go to work, and they're going to work 20 hours a day, yeah. like the CEOs that I know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that, that go, you, you cover that very well with, uh, with the Anna and Lily series. You know, even though they're, they're rich, well, you know, Anna and her family are rich, and then later by extension, uh, Lily... They're still they're still flawed and relatable and and you know and I wanted to I wanted to talk about that that series um, and how you expanded it from the three uh, the three book online uh, series to the four book uh, published. Um, well, that that gets back to Pat's to Pat's question. Okay, Shaken Shaken was my very first story that I ever wrote online. Um, that I ever posted online, and um, and I was following the Zena Uber tradition um, with the the um, pattern of you know all of us back in the days of the Xenoverse were were coming up with ways that our that our we thought our characters would meet, and that was just that was just my idea. I'd read you know I'd read a hundred different stories. Well, I mean not counting. Mavis Applewaters, I'd read 265 stories with hers. Um, I think she wrote she wrote her afternoon Wednesday afternoon mm-hmm, series mm-hmm, and had mm-hmm. and had over 150 installments in mm-hmm. that. That was just incredible. Yeah. Um, 
but we were all reading like crazy and imagining things ourselves. And that was the, that was the first story that I wrote. Um, and it, it, the characters stayed with me. They wouldn't, you know, they just wouldn't go anywhere. I wrote another one. I wrote the sequel to that, which was, which I called online. I called it stirred. The book, the book versions are, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. I wrote stirred and then I wrote strained and it was, it became the martini trilogy, obviously. (laughs) Um, and then when I went to publish that, the, the editor, the publisher and the editor asked me, they were more interested in selling big, thick books. And they asked me if I would combine that into a, a single book. And so I did, and I called it Shaken, but I trimmed out a lot of the material. And so I took what was about... What was about, um, I don't know, 150,000 words and trimmed it down to about 110 and published that as as shaken. Mm. And the story arcs were still there, but they weren't really fleshed out. And I lost a lot of a lot of parts of the book that I really was personally in love with. And um, there's probably no writer that's not in love with all of her words. So. so even when you take them out, you put them somewhere where you can, where you can open them up and visit them every now and then. And when I decided, when I when I started publishing with Bella, um, I began publishing new books. But I asked Bella to bring out my old my old titles, um, which were self published and which I'd retained the rights. And Bella did that. But I didn't want to bring out Shaken in that form because I wasn't happy with it. And I wanted to write a sequel. I had a story in mind um, that became Motherload. And I knew that I couldn't have a book that was 110 or 120,000 words and then write a sequel that was only 65 or 70. That just would look silly on the shelf. Mm. So... um, so I took the opportunity to, to go back to the original concept, which was three different stories. And I had the, I had a huge pleasure of working with Cindy Creesap to, to put out the, uh, the newer versions without warning, aftershock, small packages. And then Catherine Forrest edited the fourth one, which was Motherload. Um, and I thought that together they made a nice, four book set and people ask me constantly if I'm going to write another one and the answer is probably not um and they should probably thank me for that because the next (laughs) book it's time to it's time to do bad stuff again Mm. Um, yeah Aftershock was tough Aftershock was a very tough read for people and and small packages the book that followed was was kind of a it was a rescue book it brought uh it brought the family back together really strong and set them on a on a great path and then motherload was sort of a sort of an epilogue to that almost um to to have them start their own biological family um and and i think you know the idea of just leaving them there is a good thing because for um just for the literary value of a book, it's, it, it doesn't work just to say, I'm writing this book to show you what happens next. Because there's, you, know, you really need a story. You need a story arc. You need something dramatic that, that builds the tension and then resolves at the end. And, um, and the, next, the next way to do that would be to do something to really disrupt them. Mm. And then to fix it, and it might, you know, when you, as a romance writer, when you try to convince people that you that you you're going to let them live happily ever after, then you, you don't want to undermine your own credibility by shaking up that happiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I like where you left uh, where you left Anna and Lily and the kids. Um, I, I've I've always liked what you did um, in small packages with Lily's biological mom. Um, how you, 
you know, the, there's still a lot of, uh, of unease with, uh, on Lily's end, but, um, but it didn't, the way that you handled it, I thought, um, didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't make me feel bad. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't not, not sure exactly how to express it, but it, I, I was happy that, that you, that you addressed, um, that aspect of Lily's life and, and got some kind of resolution. I mean, it's not completely resolved, um, but there, it, it's at least been acknowledged that, you know, that, that people can change, especially after, uh, Lily's ordeal and aftershock, um, to, to have some kind of resolution with her biological mom. Yeah, the, like the, the scene in the courthouse where she turned around and and uh, and took Andy over to talk to her was uh, that was a very that was that was kind of a cathartic scene for me because uh, I wasn't really happy with the the uh, I mean if, if you read the the online version you know that it was totally different. Um, that the the whole setup for how Andy came to be um, in foster care was different, and and how she came to find him was different. So um, I still had, you know, I just still had so much broken stuff in the back of my head about how how Lily would think of her biological mother for all these years because her. Her uh, adoptive mother, Eleanor, was just such a strong force in her life, just the, the woman who rescued her. And, uh, and I think that, that Lily needed to kind of heal that, that um, anger that she carried for her mother before she could, in fact, be a, a good mother herself. I, I, that's that's one of my favorite uh, favorite series. Um, they just feel so good together, you know. Um, I really like them a lot. Well, good, thank you. I don't really like to write series. Um, I mean, that one that one stayed with me, and that one I stuck with. But people ask me all the time about sequels to other books, and I just <laughs> there's not a there's not a sequel out there, so. Don't hold your breath. Hmm. I, th- I think you you really wrap up your. I mean, you wrap things up pretty well. Mm-hmm. You know, I think uh, maybe Sea Legs. I, I wouldn't mind seeing a a sequel to that one. Um, but and and maybe Rhapsody. Um, well, the the thing about the the thing about a sequel for a romance writer. I mean, if you look at if you look at the Shaken series, I wrote two romances out of that. The, the first one, without warning, is a romance. The characters meet, they fall in love, gr- you know, girl meets girl, girl loses girl, girl gets girl back. Aftershock also was a romance. If you, you, know, if you consider the arc, they, they were together, they fell apart, they overcame the obstacles and came back together, and that was a romance. But the last two, the small packages and mother loads, they weren't romances. You're right. I hadn't thought about that before. They're just continuations on. Well, they had different. Story. They had different story arcs. They were more yeah. dramatic story arcs. And anything that you write as a sequel to a romance is not a romance unless you break them up. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'd rather you not do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Or unless you do what what um, have you had have you had Red Hawk on your show? Mm-hmm. We have. Um, did she ever talk to you about her sequel idea for uh, Teopa Kilakota? I don't remember if if we did. We didn't have her on to talk specifically about that. Andy, do you remember if we I, talked about that? I know I talked to her about it offline when I was at GCLS, and she always kept giving me that standard BS about nobody wants to see um, the Native American character. I can't think of her name at the moment. Ann Poe. Ann Poe, yeah, with another wife. I said, dude, really? That's the only way you can go? What the hell? <laughs> Come on now. That's right. That's right. So if she's going to write another romance, then 
I'm going needs another wife. Okay. Yeah, no, that's not. No, that is unacceptable. <laughs> that's right. No, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So, so there aren't really many romance sequels you can write that will that will make people happy. I mean, come on, you can't give them another wife. You can't break them up. So, what are you gonna do? Yeah. 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 You're right. <laughs> Well, you just keep doing what you're doing because you're doing a great job. Heck yeah. All right. I'll do that. Absolutely. Uh, no, I wanted to ask you just really briefly about Rhapsody. Um, I read it uh, shortly after it came out. I know it's up for a Goldie this year, uh, along with Playing with Fuego. And I read it with a friend of mine. We read it together. Um, and we both kind of had the same responses to it, um, which, which were... Um, I say, and I, I didn't. I didn't go back and look at this right uh, recently, so I don't remember the names of the characters. But there's one character who had um, who had some very uh, unhealthy sexual experiences. Ashley. And, hmm. Ashley. Ashley, and then uh, her her new partner who Julia. had Julia. Thank you. Who had just you know her last relationship where she, you know she had. Uh, been with somebody who um, who wouldn't have sex with her, and and uh, you know she swore that that she would never be with somebody like that again. And um, I'm just wondering if you if you took if you've what kind of feedback you've gotten from readers uh, about that story. I mean, obviously a whole bunch of people loved it since it's up for a Goldie, um, but for me, I was kind of like, wow, I. That just seems, for, it seemed a little extreme, uh, uh, Ashley's response to um, to her trauma, which normally I'm, I'm really sympathetic, but for some reason it just, it, 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 it seemed a little extreme. And then Julia going, um, going kind of in the opposite direction of where she had stated that, that she wanted to go. I was just wondering if you've gotten other feedback like that or if it's been primarily. Oh, no, I've gotten lots, I've gotten lots of feedback like that. I mean, I, I, knew when I, I knew when I wrote the book. I knew when I started the book. I knew how it would end. And, um, and I knew that the, um, I knew that there would be readers out there who would be disappointed because their idealized ending would have been for Ashley to overcome her issues. Mm -hmm. But the way that I set the book up was in fact so that only one of those characters could complete their character journey. If Ashley completed hers, then Julia didn't have to complete hers. Mm. And... In this case, Julia was the one who completed hers when she realized that that she loved Ashley enough that she was willing to be with her even if even if it meant that they could never have sex. Mm. Even if it meant that that her her barriers were too strong. She she loved her enough that that she wanted to be with her, even if that wasn't possible. And so Julia completed her journey, and Ashley didn't have to. Hmm. But in the, but there are, you know, there's another way to look at it. Did, did Ashley get a happy ending? Yeah, she well, did. Yeah, she did. Yeah. She found somebody who would love her and accept her just the way she was. And would she, 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 she did put the feel pressure safe? On. Yeah, and she felt safe enough to because there wasn't the pressure on her to right. to to grow uh, even you know to grow closer to uh, to that. I think you know I think that that as a you know as, as somebody who reads so many romances to have to have have it end the way that, that you had it end we're not you were, we're not used to that we're not ready for that it's not something you know we're, we're looking for you know 10 more pages that's going to wrap it all up nice and happy yeah. <laughs> and, i know i know there. and and uh, again i i respect i respect that in in what readers want but that's not that for me wasn't the story that that i was telling i mean if you if you um i didn't i didn't write the I didn't write the bit about the dogs accidentally. Um, that was part of the theme of the book. Julia went 
she went to the um, to the home of the woman who was rescuing greyhounds, and the gray and and the lady said, you know, if you want a if you want a dog that's that's going to be fun and easygoing, you got these dogs over here, but this one over here is special. Bijou is special. She needs something special, hmm. and and Julia made her choice then not to take one of the rambunctious, friendly dogs that was well-adjusted. She took the one that needed help. And that, was, and that was Julia's growing moment. That's when, that's when she completed her journey. That's when she went from, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna demand the easy things. I'm, I'm gonna, there's, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. And so she made the, the choice for the tough dog and she made the choice for the tough girlfriend. Hmm. And, and to answer your, your earlier concern, the idea for the book was based on some women I knew a long time ago. Um, a couple who'd been together for, gosh, they've now been together for over 50 years and they've never had sex. Wow. And I, and, and the story behind that is that one of them was, um, brutally traumatized at 11 years old and cannot bear to be touched. Mm. And, and that, and she's, you know, she's the, a lovely person that you could fall in love with. Hmm. And, Thank goodness someone did yeah. 50 years ago hmm. and has stayed with her all this time. But it's who she is. And I think that, that the, very, you know, the very special person in Rhapsody was Julia. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. Well, um, I wanted to talk with you about, about one more thing. Um, we've had we've had um, several people who were who are big in the Xenoverse. Um, uh, sorry, my my dog <laughs> is is getting a little rambunctious. Um, and oh, geez, hold on one second. Sorry, <clears throat> I'm going to have to let my dog in because otherwise he's going to tear the door down. Okay, I have rescue dogs too, so I, I, I understand about the dogs that need extra help. Get out of there. Um, one of the things that, that keeps coming up for, um, for folks that, that we talked to that were big in this universe is the lack of, um, of contact that you get with the fans. Um, has that been something that, that, you've, that you've had to deal with too, or do you still get a lot of feedback? Um, you know, the first time I, when I first posted Shaken, within, um, within a couple of weeks, I probably had three or 400 emails. Wow. Jeez. Um, the last time I posted a story online, um, it was for the Academy of Bards Valentine special. I didn't get a single note. Wow. So, um, so I think that, that I think a, a few things have happened. I think, I think that a lot of those four or 500 people who wrote the first time didn't feel like they needed to do that afterwards. You know, they don't feel like they need to do it with each and every story or, or they, you know, they read something and they've written you three or four times. They don't feel you know, may, this one's not quite their favorite. I'm not going to write to you and tell you about this, but but uh, it, it back in the days of the Xenoverse, things were so electric. Everybody was so excited, and I think that um, I think that over time, you know, as the show went away, as the as the fandom began to shrink, I think that people. People just generally got less excited, and they sort of changed their expectations about um, about what they were reading. Hmm. Uh, people like people like me who 
And a lot of us who went on to write books, we stopped posting our stories online, and we lost a lot of our we lost a lot of our fandom for that. But you know, they weren't writing us, and they weren't you know they weren't going to buy our books. And so you know, in some ways, we we um, have to stop and say, well, what did we lose? Um, if you don't know if you don't know who's on the end of that story out there, and you don't hear uh, people come and talk to you and people ask you questions about, um, about things they read, then you just sort of feel like you're, you know, riding into the dark Mm -hmm. and, um, and you don't have to feel that way really with, um, social media exploding the way it has. I mean, when I put out a new book, it might be that the only thing I hear, I know I'll still get I'll still get several hundred comments. Some of them will be, uh, you know, not as many of them will be emails. Um, so more like just Facebook. More will be like Facebook. Like I just, I, yeah, just finished Rhapsody, loved it, and um, and that's and that takes the place of of a long note that I might have gotten, you know, several years ago. And the other thing I think that's happened is that authors have become very approachable and that, of course that's a very good thing mm-hmm. uh, because when I write I literally know the you know I can picture the faces of the people who are going to be reading the book mm-hmm. I know who I'm writing for I know who my audience is I know which ones I'm going to make happy which ones I'm not going to make happy <laughs> and um, and I know which ones I'll have a chance to talk to so um, I think that that you know, every everything about the the feedback loop has changed since the early days when it really was only email. Hmm. Interesting, and then that's those are all things that that we've talked about. We've had Linda Christ on. We've had uh, Susan Maher on a couple of times, and. Um, I think we've had some other folks too, and and you know, for for some, I mean, it, it seems like it's been a really discouraging, um, you know, that lack of of um, of feedback. But but then, I mean, you do exactly what you said. You know, you've got there's so many different venues for people to connect with the authors, and and it's not it's so different you know lesbic is so different from like mainstream publishing i've used this example before i would never i would never think about sending stephen king an email Mm -hmm. you know and saying hey i really liked your last book because honestly i just don't first of all i don't think he'd see it and i don't know that he would care but with um but with lesbic authors you know i i know a lot of these people and yeah we're we're a community we really are yeah yeah and and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of fan fiction writers and a lot of people posting these days at uh, at places like the um, Athenaeum at at the Academy of Bards that um, they're really just coming into you know maybe they're just aging into the um, the craft or maybe you know they worked and now they're retired and now they have time to do something and now they're you know they're exploring things online and um new people come to the fandom all the time so what what is missing though is um i think that i think that the academy of bards it's it's just a treasure trove it's just Mm -hmm. a wonderful archive of of um Stories, but I think what it lacks is uh, a communication module. There's not a, um, you know, the the Athenaeum has has that. Um, mm-hmm. They have a message board. In the, there, yeah. yeah, they have a well, they have a message board, but they also have a rate this story, mm-hmm. uh, leave a review, mm-hmm. and they have recently begun uh, building a Facebook presence. So. So people can people can tie the two things together. Now that's what's missing. The last time I posted a story um, at the Academy of Bards, I expected to hear something about it from someone on Facebook, and it was like it was almost as if the two communities are 
uh, completely orthogonal, hmm. that, that they, they just don't overlap at all. So it was, it was just, it was odd. It was strange to me. I know a lot of people who, who used to be in the, in the fan fiction reading community got, they got spoiled when they started reading books and, and um, they got spoiled for quality and they don't want to read fan fiction anymore because it's not up to the standards that they're, that they're used to. Hmm. Uh, we've, we, you know, we, we talk about fan fiction too, and we've had, uh, you know, we have have uh, authors on that that either are just uh, fan fiction or that have that have uh, that do both or have just crossed over into publishing, and you know. Andy and I've talked about this before. When when we talk about a fan fiction piece, um, we don't we don't really honestly we don't hold it to the same standard mm-hmm. that, right. that we hold a Nor uh, published we. book. No, you're absolutely <laughs> yeah. right, and I, that's one of the that's one of my pet peeves. And I know that this is there's been more and more conversations in um, in the lesbian community about. Um, you know, folks giving four and five star ratings to to books that are so terribly written, but we're happy to see you know just another lesbic book out. Um, you know, we don't we're not many times readers aren't holding published books up to the standard that professionally published books should be, um, and and that that I think we I think that more and more people stepping up and saying and demanding better quality, better editing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that, that hopefully in the next few years we'll see, we'll see uh, the publishers and, and indie writers step up and, and treat it for, for what it is. I mean, we're laying out money for these books. We expect, we should expect a quality product. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a right to. I think you have a right to, and I think what will you know what will eventually happen is that um, people will people who have a um, you know maybe a little more disposable income and they don't mind um, making a three or four dollar mistake on a download um, will have a, a higher tolerance, but um, but people who are who are looking for something better aren't going to. Over time, they're they're going to learn that you know twenty five five star reviews that appeared at the same time um, are probably um, the author and her partner logging in and out as different people, <laughs> and or, or they're, um, they're hardcore fans who think that they can do no wrong no matter what they put out. Yeah, yeah, and and they and they. Typically, we'll pay two or three dollars for a book, and that's their and that's their threshold. Mm-hmm. They they would probably enjoy the ten dollar book more, but they don't want to pay it pay ten dollars for it. So they're not going to you know they're not going to read that. They're going to be satisfied, and I think the market finds its level. But um, but people who are who are more demanding and more discerning, I believe, will um, they'll pick out their authors that they want um, that they want to follow and and um, stick with them, not take chances on on other books. I think one of the um, one of the good things about the indie writing now is that there are a lot of book ideas that are getting they're getting published because the the existing publishers don't feel that they can market those that they're not you know this this you know this is not quite what bella publishes or mm. this is not quite what bold strokes publishes mm-hmm. or it's not quite what regal crest publishes but um but that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who want to read it. Mm-hmm. So, but it just means that a publisher really can't take a chance on that because she may be afraid that, you know, if you invest money on it, you're going to lose money on it because it's not it's not going to make your readers happy, the readers that you've cultivated. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean at all that the story is that the story is 
is bad. I think it's a very good thing about independent publishing is that some of these some of these stories that that um, don't necessarily appeal to large audiences will really hit a smaller target uh, in a in a very sweet spot. Mm -hmm. But the downside is that a lot of these. I mean, it's just a fact that a lot of these independently published books aren't being edited. Right. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and it's and it's frustrating to a lot of readers. It's not frustrating to everybody. Some people don't care. Yeah. But and a lot of people that that have come up, you know, reading and all they read is fan fiction. Um, you know, primarily, you know, we we build up a tolerance where we can just overlook things. You know, it just like skim right over, and it doesn't yeah. it doesn't affect us. Um, I mean, I've read some really good indie indie writers. You know, Claire Ashton, her after Mrs. Hamilton. I can see why uh, you know a Bella or a Bold Strokes may not pick that up. It deals with some different issues that that um, that folks that that make people go. Um, but it was really <laughs> well done and and well put together, well edited. Um, you know, Q Kelly puts out books that are not your standard fare, but well written and, and well done. But you you know, I get books for my review site sent in by indie readers or indie writers. Uh, I get books every week that that me or that I or or my my other reviewers we can't get more than a few pages in. Yeah, and it, you know, but I agree. I mean, it, they're absolutely, it, it's certainly it's a it's a great thing to have so much, uh, so many. Uh, independently published authors and and smaller publishing houses who are who are taking chances uh, for for me i won't read a new author unless i know somebody who i trust who's already read it you know yeah. uh, and and that's i don't read reviews i don't trust them um which is shitty for somebody who owns a review site to yeah. say, but, <laughs> but, but I don't, you can't, you can't. So I, you know, I, I have, I have a few people that I trust that, that, that I know that if they say something's good, even if I don't like it as much as they do, it's not going to be terrible. Right. Well, your, you know, your voice is, um, your voice is a voice that some people will look to, to, um, you know, they'll look to your to your website to, you know, what is what is Sherry reading now, and and uh, if Sherry likes it, I'll like it because I like the things that she likes, and and uh, people build a following with with reviewers, and uh, it doesn't mean you agree with them all the time, but if you get a recommendation from someone who typically likes the same things you like, then it's you know it's a, reasonable to take a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, KG, I have to say that this has been... I was really nervous before we started. I mean, Andy, I get on early. I just can't imagine why. <laughs> because... <laughs> why? Oh, well, because... Okay. Because you're like the queen of, of lesbic. I mean, honestly, I, I started out... Um, I came to fan fiction through a you know a tiny little fandom for bad girls. I had never really. I used to snicker at oh fan fiction, <laughs> and then I got strung out on it. And and um, and you were one of the first. You know you and Allie Valley and uh, and Linda Chris. You know, but but mostly you. And I fell in love with with Anna and Lily immediately. And then I just I consumed everything that that you wrote and. Um, you know, and then we, uh, you know, I, I was the webmaster for the Caring for Kara uh, auction, and your your generosity blew me away. And, oh, uh, that wasn't me, though. That I mean, the, the, no, but it was, it, but it was you because because. Uh, because you had put up, you know, uh, a couple of books and, and somebody bid really high and you just jumped right in and, and you said, everybody that, that matches this, I'll put up more books. And, and because of you and, and that generosity, not to take away from what everybody else did, because it was, man, that was, that was just an incredible, incredible outpouring of love and support. That mm -hmm. is something I've never seen before, but, but you personally, um, you blew me away, and and I'm a very very cynical person, um, just in general, and and that moved me. Your the the way that you 
that you well, just jumped in and did that. It blew me away. And, and those people moved me too. They really did. They, um, um, I mean, the the idea that someone would um, would give that much money for an autographed book for me that's not that's not what they're that's not what they're getting. What they're doing is they're stepping up for. Kara, and that and that's what makes them feel good. And I'm just, I'm just glad to be associated with people like that. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's what's so totally wonderful about our community is that is that we really are a community. That we're not. Um, I mean, yes, we sell books, but we're not we're not a business as much as we are a family. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. Yep. That, that that event I think really really brought that home to to me and to a lot of people. Yep. Yeah, I had a I had a blog on that. I don't know if you if you had a chance to see it, but I that happened to be the same week that um, that all of my biological family was lining up at Chick Fil A to eat. Yeah, and um, and I and it and it really and it really struck me how. Um, the contrast of one family versus the other family, um, and the the way that that one family was doing something that they knew was hurtful, while the other family was uh, was just dumping out their wallets to help someone who really needed it, yep. and um, and and the the love that that lives in our community for people we really don't even know, but people we have a kinship with through our, through our books is, um, that's just one of the most valuable things in my life. Mm -hmm. Wow. I I didn't see that, but that, that really is. (laughs) Wow. Brings the point home too, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, it really does. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I'm I'm really glad that um, that you came on the show and that I got uh, <laughs> Andy too, but you know, but that I got a chance to talk with you. you do, so. <laughs> I'm glad I did too. It's about time. Yeah, right. <laughs> you've got a standing invitation anytime okay. you want to come oh. on. I know you've got a new book coming out. I, I did. Yes, I did. I didn't want to let us go. West of Nowhere is a, is the sort of book that I think people who read a lot of uh, fan fiction from the Xenoverse are really going to enjoy. These two characters are uh, relatively young, 24 and 29, and um, and they are as different as night and day. One is one is very responsible. She's a Navy veteran who is uh, just absolutely meticulous about uh, details. She she landed planes on an aircraft carrier for fuck's sake. So wow. she is one of these people who who won't leave a pen on the desk. She'll put it in the drawer and close the drawer. Amber, on the other hand, is a sloth. <laughs> she is um, she is careless. She is she has a mouth, and um, back talks and sasses everyone, and and uh, very emotionally immature. Um, and these two are thrown together in in uh, interesting circumstances and. And you will not like you will not like Amber when you start this book. You you may read a lot of this book before you like Amber. <laughs> but, but I promise you that this is going to be one of the most satisfying books of mine that you'll read. Wow! Fantastic. That's a pretty big claim. Yeah, no it lie. Is. It is. Wow! Mm. I can't wait to read it. Yep. Yep. Well, and it if, comes uh, out. It comes out in June. Um, I'll have copies of it at GCLS, and um, and if if um, I think the ebook may be, may even be available June first. I may have to pick one of those I'm up thinking, and, then, yeah. and then get it autographed. Absolutely. All right. So this might be a really good time to play our game. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, oh how could you forget about that? <laughs> I, the listeners are like, you didn't do it on the last show. What the hell? I know. We totally forgot. <laughs> we did. We totally forgot. So, what did we talk about? 
I don't know. Oh, almost heaven. Okay, yeah, never yeah, mind. Almost heaven. So we're not going to miss it this time. Here we go, people. Who would you fuck? So, yeah. Uh, playing with Fuego, if you could have one passionate night, which character would it be for you? You're asking me? Of course I'm asking <laughs> yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I'm going to go with Elena Diaz. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's and awesome. if you don't know why, you need to go back and read Malicious Pursuit. There you go. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to go buy that one now. <laughs> yeah, right? I was thinking the same thing. Okay, Rev? Well, I thought I was going to have to go with Morty's wife, but um, <laughs> since Maribel hasn't been tagged yet, um, I'm going to go for Maribel. Oh, wow. We have picked the same person because I was so, going for Mari. Yep. So we're going to be sharing again. Apparently. I think I, I got first last time, so yeah. you can go first this time. I, oh, yay. You can have the sloppy <laughs> seconds. All right. That's fine. Works out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Mari's really talented in that she could probably deal with both of you at the same time. Oh, see, now, no oh, But teasing. we're like sisters, and I don't think I could do that. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm burning my redness. Okay. So, that was fun. That was very well, fun. Well, we need to talk about the giveaway. Oh, yes, I know. I hadn't forgotten. Oh, okay, okay. I just don't want to go away yet. No, the game was fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. The game okay. is always fun, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. now... I'm blushing a little. Now, now it's time for the readers to uh, have a little fun. All right. So, um, so how we usually do this, KG, is um, we have... Everybody who wants to enter into the drawing, post a comment on uh, on our website for this particular podcast. Um, so since KG has so many wonderful things out there, I think the, the question is obvious. What's your favorite and why? Mm-hmm. So um, we need everybody to please post your comments, uh, letting us know which of KG's works uh, online, uh, or published doesn't matter or both whichever if you if you like something that's both and you've read both tell us what you like different you know about the differences and we need all entries in by May 3rd mm-hmm. okay um, and we will announce the winner on, uh, on on the show that we record on May 4th which uh, will be welcoming JD Glass on mm-hmm. yep okay so everybody knows what you're supposed to do you've done this a million times before um, good luck to everybody before we go, I want to remind everyone to please, please get over and vote for um, for your favorite episodes of 2012. Andy and I are doing a special episode just to talk about um, the best of 2012. I have no idea how well, that's going to turn out yet, but <laughs> we'll um, make up something. <laughs> we may pick a fanfic or something to talk about too. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so get over the the voting. You have until May 17th. Um, to get your votes in. You get to vote on a, a regular episode, a flicks and swizzle sticks, and a, a bar rag or conversations at the bar. Yep. All right? Yep. And right now, Anne McMahon is kicking everyone's is ass. Is she? Wow. Yes. No kidding. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Melissa Braden fans, where are you? Yeah, where are they? Where the hell they go? Jeebus. <laughs> okay, and then also don't forget about the Bearded Clam Challenge. 10 to 30,000 words must contain the phrases bearded clam and cocktail hour. Submissions must be edited and uh, and submitted by July 15th mm-hmm. for our team of savvy judges. That's right. Okay? All right. Fantastic. That was a lot, was a lot to announce. It was. Yeah. And my drink is gone, so I guess the show's over. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> the party's uh, over. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Oh. My pleasure. Look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Excellent. All Thank right. you. All right. Bye. So long. Bye. Bye.